Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Learning Lunch hosted by Format Approved. My name is Brian Johnson. I'm the Senior Director of Online Education with Format Approved, and I'll be your moderator for today's session. Today's session is titled Your Technology, Probably a False Sense of Security, and HIPAA Compliance, too. We're very pleased to have with us Mike Semmel, president of Semmel Consulting, one of the top HIPAA experts in the country, and also the author of our HIPAA training. So it's been a while since we've had Mike with us for a learning lunch. Thank you so much for joining us today, Mike. Great to be here, Brian. All right, well, you can see Mike's bio here. He has quite a bit of experience in this field, as you can see, and uh, going back with a strong emphasis in IT, which I think is really important for HIPAA these days. So I will let his bio speak for itself. We can look at the questions we're gonna cover today uh, while I just go over some quick housekeeping notes and then we'll get into the presentation. So you can see what we'll cover uh, and then be aware of the fact that you're gonna get the slides from this presentation and a video recording of it. So people always ask us, you know, can, can we see the slides? Uh, can we get them after the event? And of course, we'll be happy to send those to you along with other information. The other thing to note is that people can ask questions of our presenter at any time during the session by typing those into the chat area. We save those questions for the end just to keep the flow going. If we don't get to your question during the live session, sometimes we run out of time, we will uh, provide all those questions to our expert, Mike, and he will then go along and answer those in writing after the event. So ask your question at any time, just be aware that we'll, send the, we'll save those questions for the end and you'll get the slides in the recording afterwards. All right, enough housekeeping, let's get down to the event. All right, so Mike, I understand that you were in Washington for the recent HIPAA conference. What did you learn about HIPAA audits at that event? Well, there's a lot of news, Brian, and, you know, the first obvious question that everyone was wondering was that the Office for Civil Rights that enforces HIPAA has been talking about audits for a long time, but nothing seemed to be happening. And the director, Jocelyn Samuels, the assistant director, Devin McGraw, and others were there talking about the audits, and there's really a lot that's happened, and the audits are imminent. Now, in government terms, that still may mean a few more months, but they have hired a contractor to do the administration of the audits. In other words, to gather all the materials once someone gets an audit letter. And the Office for Civil Rights has been hiring attorneys, uh, quite a few attorneys in fact. And uh, as my friends in government tell me, you know, they snicker and say, you know, we're from the government and we're here to help you. Uh, I don't think those attorneys are being hired to help people. I think what they're doing is uh, they're preparing for dealing with 1,200 audited organizations and how to respond and uh, deal with the, the consequences. So they're going to do 1,200 audits and across the whole healthcare spectrum, and that includes all the covered entities and the business associates, your odds of getting an audit letter aren't high, certainly from a probability standpoint, but if you get an audit letter, there could be a very high impact on your organization. So I don't think you can ignore this. In 2012, they only did 115 audits. This is 1,200 audits. We're thinking that the audits are going to be likely to be focused on smaller practices, and the reason for that is going back to 2012, one of the uh, reviews of the audits by the Office for Civil Rights said that out of the population that they audited, the 115, they found kind of a disproportionate number of smaller providers who aren't prepared to comply with HIPAA. Some of them have been neglectful. Others were not able to produce information that was requested. Uh, some of them had just were clueless and didn't have uh, really even the basics in place. The problem with this is that if you do get an audit letter, you're going to have a short response time, less than two weeks, to provide all the information that's requested. And if you have been neglectful of HIPAA or if you really you know, haven't kept up in the last few years, uh, that's not a long period of time to get everything together. And the other thing that's different about these audits is that they are going to not just include the covered entities, the health care providers and the health plans that are being audited, but if you're audited, your business associates will also be audited. And that's a pretty scary prospect for a lot of uh, medical practices and hospitals and health plans 
because business associates often sign business associate agreements. In some cases, they don't sign business associate agreements, but even those that do are pretty clueless about what they're supposed to do to comply. And the rules all changed in 2013 when business associates were made directly liable for data breach penalties and also have to comply with HIPAA just like a covered entity. That means that a business associate, in addition to signing the agreements, have to train their employees in HIPAA, they have to document things in accordance with HIPAA, and they have to comply just like a covered entity. So when we're talking to our clients who are covered entities, uh, in many cases, uh, we do have business associates as well, we're asking the covered entities, are they really sure that their business associates are going to be able to pass an audit because that could come back on them for doing business with someone that hasn't complied with HIPAA. So there's quite a bit to this audit program. Uh, like I said, the odds are, are low, but the impact could be very high for your practice. The other thing that happened at the HIPAA uh, security conference in Washington, and the conference was sponsored by NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technologies, and OCR, the Office for Civil Rights that enforces HIPAA, and those two agencies are the ones that you always think of when it comes to HIPAA compliance and enforcement. But the Federal Trade Commission did a presentation there. And what's interesting about the Federal Trade Commission, it's frankly pretty scary if you're uh, in the healthcare business or if you're a business associate, that the Federal Trade Commission recently had its authority to enforce data breach penalties affirmed by a federal court. And that was important because there were a couple of big cases, Wyndham Hotels and Lab MD, where the authority of the FTC to enforce data breach penalties was challenged, and the federal courts came out very strongly supporting the Federal Trade Commission. And the approach that the FTC takes when it comes to data breach enforcement isn't HIPAA specifically, it's that patients are consumers and that doctors and hospitals and uh, health plans and business associates all have to protect the privacy and the security of the information related to those consumers. So if there's a breach, it's actually under the Federal Trade Commission's authority for any business that has a breach, not just in healthcare, but in healthcare, the re reason that it's scary is that the fines can be stiffer than what the Office for Civil Rights, uh, that what they assess, and also the Office for Civil Rights, when they're enforcing HIPAA, will typically put an organization on a compliance program or corrective action plan that may go on for a year or two. The Federal Trade Commission regularly, after data breaches, puts organizations on 20-year monitored compliance programs. And that's just very, very expensive and onerous. The other thing is that the FTC actually caused LabMD to close. And there are some uh, lawsuits and things going on in the courts right now, not just going after the FTC and their authority, but whether or not it was fair and, and whether that investigation was handled properly. But the fact of the matter is that the Federal Trade Commission put a healthcare organization out of business. And there's a lot of information on the internet about that. The last thing is that these are not either or types of investigations and penalties. If the Office for Civil Rights is investigating a data breach, the Federal Trade Commission can too, or if the state attorney general is looking at a data breach, the FTC can too. And in Minneapolis a few years ago, there was a data breach that the Minnesota State Attorney General was investigating. The FTC got involved. The Minnesota Attorney General forced this business associate to stop doing business in Minnesota for two years. So basically, the Attorney General kicked him out of the state for two years. At the same time, the Federal Trade Commission piled on with a 20-year compliance program for that organization. So the message to you is that uh, preventing breaches is more important today than ever before because there are more and more people that want to come after you 
if you've had a breach. So secure your data, encrypt your devices. The word encryption I probably heard no fewer than 50 times at the HIPAA security conference. And uh, at the conference, they announced a new penalty for an organization, a 13-doctor cancer on, uh, radiology clinic that had a bag stolen out of an employee's car, and the bag included an unencrypted laptop and an unencrypted backup device, and the penalty was $750,000. Yeah, you know, that is the oldest story in uh, the High Tech Act since it exempted encrypted information from breach reporting. It just seems like, you know, week after week, laptops are getting stolen out of cars that the practice never encrypted the data, and they're having huge breaches because of that. So just to emphasize Mike's point, encrypt your data if there is any possible way you can do it. Well, that's all. And, Brian, the other thing that Go we ahead. see with encryption Oh, sorry to interrupt. The, the other thing we see with encryption is that organizations are doing things like encrypting their devices mm -hmm. and they're spending money on it, but then they're not training their users and sometimes the users will take a USB stick, a flash drive, and download data onto that from an encrypted device. Now the data is on an unencrypted flash drive, which is frankly a lot easier to lose than yeah, that's a laptop worse. or desktop <laughs> computer. Right. And part of this goes back to, to training people and making sure you close the loop on what your users are really doing and are they using the tools you've invested in. That's a great point too. Yeah, if humans can find a way around things and they're not properly trained, they tend to do it and then it defeats the whole, all your technology is for naught then. Well, this is so this is great. We see now that enforcement is reaching a whole new level that should give people some concern. Uh, when it comes down to the technology itself, what concerns should practices have? Well, the first concern is that you have to admit that you have valuable property in the data that you store. So, you know, as with many of these, you know, 12-step programs and things, the first thing is admitting you have a problem, and I think that's a key message. So when you look at the picture on this slide, you see a laptop with gold on it. We try to get our clients to think of data as gold because if it was a 10-pound gold bar, they would protect it a whole lot better than many of them protect their data. And every day we work with healthcare organizations of every size, small medical practices, chains of nursing homes that have thousands of employees, uh, everything in between. And what we find is that there's very lax control over how people are logging in and what their uh, password rules are. We find many places that tell us their passwords are set to expire in 60 days. When we look, they're set to never expire. And there are very few controls over logins and passwords. So that's the first place to start. And HIPAA has a requirement for unique user identification, which means that every individual, even logging onto a computer, if that computer has access to data on the network, then people have to log in individually and you have to have logging turned on. It has to be tracked. Uncontrolled access to files. We find a lot of uh, organizations, and again, from very small to very large, where it's not the electronic health record system that's the problem. It's the Windows directories or the server files or the cloud access, if that's where people are storing their data where they really haven't restricted people by role or by authority, and essentially people have access to shared folders and things that have a lot of information they shouldn't be able to get to. Poor user management is kind of a catch-all for some of the above that we've talked about, but also training the users and making sure that the users are following the rules and regulations of the organization. I mentioned the idea of putting a flash drive into a secure computer and taking the data off site, I put that under poor user management. And some of that has to do with training, some of it has to do with people wanting their systems to be convenient and easy to use when security does require some inconvenience. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you're at the airport or whether you are at uh, a public building or even going into a sporting event these days. We have to empty our pockets, we have to slow down, go through metal detectors, and it's just the way of the world. Uh, 
lack of security patches and updates. We literally see this every single day where clients have systems that don't have current patches and updates. Some of the examples are servers where the IT department or the outsourced uh, IT vendor doesn't want to patch and restart servers because it can interrupt the business. We see a lot of workstations, which are PCs and laptops, that don't get their security patches and updates. And patching and updating is consistently listed as probably the number one security tool. And that is once these uh, updates or, or once the weaknesses, the vulnerabilities are identified, it takes a little while for the companies to issue the updates. But in the meantime, uh, you've got people that know that those vulnerabilities exist and they're trying to exploit them. Well, this is not something where somebody's missing an update from last week and it just hasn't cycled through. We're finding organizations that really should know better that are missing patches, uh, you know, 50, 75, or over 100 patches on a device, which means that nobody's doing patching and updating on those things. Within the healthcare environment, you have regular computers that people use for their daily work, but sometimes you have computers that are attached to medical devices. And these could be anything from sonograms, ultrasounds, lab equipment, uh, gastroenterology practice may have a device for endoscopies or uh, even a pill cam where you can swallow the camera and uh, it basically does the endoscopy on its way through your body. There are all sorts of devices that are out there and one of the things that we find is that those devices are not normally managed by the IT department because the computers came as part of a, a package and the package include the diagnostic device or the lab device or whatever and the software running on a computer so the IT department doesn't manage that, the lab doesn't manage that uh, or the OBGYN staff doesn't manage it if it's say a sonogram and the company that delivered it or shipped it doesn't want to be bothered with patches and updates and restarting the systems and all that so they literally just don't do it. So we find a lot of the issues that uh, we find in healthcare are related to the medical devices and the computers. Other things that we found recently are Windows XP machines, which should have been retired back in uh, 2014, because in April of 2014, Microsoft stopped issuing security patches and updates for those, and they're a risk on anybody's network. So we find a lot of these things related to the managed or to the medical devices that are unmanaged and kind of out of sight out of mind within the organizations themselves and you know we also understand that this doesn't matter really in our experience whether it's a small organization or a large organization is that the IT people are focused on keeping the networks up and running and no one's really auditing IT for compliance and in the financial departments and organizations, uh, the accountants, the bookkeepers, the controllers, the chief financial officers all expect audits because that's traditional in the accounting arena. And when you get to IT, no one really thinks of auditing because a lot of times you have the people managing organizations, they don't understand IT, and they don't know what to look for. So a lot of these problems get missed because no one internally is auditing IT and the practice doesn't bring in someone or the organization doesn't bring in someone from the outside to audit IT because they really don't think about it. Uh, at the end, I'm, I'm just going to repeat, security requires inconvenience. You have to go through login procedures. Computers have to time out in waiting rooms, in examining rooms in order to secure the data and that is inconvenient for people but HIPAA requires it. We're all patients. We don't want our medical records accessed by someone who shouldn't and if you go into an examining room as a patient and I was in a doctor's office recently I went over and jiggled the mouse before the doctor got in and I was locked out of the system which was correct. I've also done that at medical practices where I'm looking at the last patient's record. So and, you and have to get case. over the hump. In that case, you're actually logged in, presumably, as somebody else and uh, someone in the practice, and you could look up any record, do whatever you want in the system. 
Well, Brian, you can do more than look up the record. Would you like me to go in and change your blood type? Yeah. No, please don't. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So it's very important that those automatic log off uh, uh, policies be in place as, as well as all these other things that you're mentioning. So you talked a little bit about how IT doesn't get audited, but what gives practice managers a false sense of security when they're thinking about compliance? Well, again, this is all based on experience, and it's not uh, something that, you know, has happened a long time ago. These things occur every day as we're working with medical practices that the practice managers just don't understand IT. And it's not that they don't understand how to use their computer. They don't understand the security things that they need to know or that need to be addressed within their organization, dealing with servers and firewalls and how the network's designed and the types of uh, things like patches and updates that we were talking about before. And to many people, it's a foreign language. And what happens is that they'll ask someone, an IT person uh, that either works for them or an IT uh, managed service provider or a solution provider that helps them, and everything's always OK. And they don't know the hard questions to ask. And when I say hard questions, not, not to be mean, questions, but uh, these are questions that you have to get the right answers to or else you're going to have a data breach or fail an audit. So one of the things that we see regularly is that we will ask a practice administrator or another person that's not an IT person about their technology and will tell us everything's fine. We'll ask them about their firewall. They say it's fine. And we get general answers like that. But then when we look, we find out that things aren't configured properly or the security subscriptions aren't current. So they believe what they're told, and they're not demanding evidence to prove it. And when you're in healthcare, when you're in even financial organizations or financial departments where you're audited, asking to have proof of something is not a challenging question. It's not an insulting question. It's just the way that the world works when you're in a critical situation. So more and more we see you know, changes to health care that involve safety, and they're trying to reduce hospital readmissions and things like that. And as you get down to the details, a lot of them are simple checklists and things that people can use to protect themselves, protect their patients, or in the case of data, protect the patient's identity by requiring evidence and paying attention. I know because we, we hear this every day that we're, when we're dealing with administrators that they've got so many competing uh, things for their time, like meaningful use, ICD-10. All of these things are just happening at once. And I'm not sure it's ever going to get better even after some of these deadlines pass. But someone has to be paying attention to this. And these HIPAA audits are not something that you should be you know, worried about now in terms of, you know, where do I start? HIPAA came into effect in 2003, the privacy rule, the security rule in 2005, the data breach rule in 2009, and the HIPAA omnibus final rule in 2013. So it's been a minimum of two years when you look back on the omnibus rule, but really when you go back to the HIPAA basics, you're going back uh, 12 years where this compliance program should have been in place. So I'm not lecturing people. I'm just saying that this isn't something that people should be scrambling about uh, and starting right now. The last thing is that people are just generally unwilling to invest in IT security and consultants. And we find this where people say, well, we can do our own audit, or I bought a kit to do it, and all that. And our reaction is that you know we're specialists, just like doctors are specialists. We know what to look for. We know how to treat the problems that we identify. And when we go into a place that where people have done their own or outsourced it to, say, their IT company to come in and do a not just a security risk analysis, which is tied to IT, but talk to them generally about their HIPAA compliance, we find a lot of gaps that need to be resolved. Well, you know, Mike, why do you think it is that people are reluctant to go with security consultants? Just that it's a cultural thing that they ha they aren't accustomed to doing it, so they haven't thought of it as something as an expense that they need to, you know, uh, 
invest in? Well, that, but also, Brian, I think that they're not feeling pain. Yeah. And if, if you felt the pain, if you, you know, if, if you were dealing this with something after you've had a breach, then you're going to react to it a lot differently than if you've never had a breach and you don't think it's going to happen to you. And of course, that is the worst time to get your compliance program in place is after you've suffered a breach, as I'm sure that 13 physician practice could tell anyone on the call. Um, I just want to, before we go on, I want to remind our audience, we've got a couple of questions already, but if you have questions as Mike is going through this presentation, please go ahead and put those into the chat area and we will get to them at the end of the presentation. All right, well, let's get down to some more technical stuff here. When it comes to things like networks and servers and firewalls, what do people need to understand about them, Mike? Well, the first thing that you need to understand is that they're hard to understand. <laughs> and the reason for that is that when you're sitting at your desk and you're typing on your computer, you don't think about what's going on in the background behind the walls. And when I say behind the walls, the network cabling and the information you're typing going down through the network to a server or to a firewall to go out to the internet. So part of this is that the this is the back end, behind the scenes part of IT, and they're hidden from view and they're hard to understand. So it's just natural that people don't pay a lot of attention to them. You know, I've said to people before, you don't really know you have a stomach until it hurts. And with the network servers and firewalls and the, the networking switches and routers and other parts of the network, you don't realize that it's even there just when everything's working. So they're hidden from view. The other thing is because they're hard to understand, they need special security expertise, not just general IT knowledge. And we have found a lot of practices that have had their IT guys, and, and they're good guys, they're conscientious, they want to do the right thing, but they're really not security experts, and they're not experts in firewall configurations and uh, switches. And now, one of the things about networks that has changed over uh, the last 10 or 15 years is that a computer network used to be for computers. And that sounds obvious, but in today's world, we have copiers on the networks. We have video surveillance cameras on the networks. We have voice over IP phone systems on the networks. We have the heating and air conditioning controls on the network. So there are more and more people that need access to the network. There are more and more devices that are sharing the network. And it becomes a big challenge when you're dealing with security that you just can't let people loose on your network and give them the access that they need and not think about is that affecting the confidentiality of patient data. We've talked about it before, patches and updates in the context of computers, but servers need patches and updates, firewalls and network switches need firmware updates, and the firewalls themselves also need current security subscriptions because it's just like your antivirus software that gets updated on a regular basis on your computer. There are subscriptions for malware, they call it. It's, it's a little different than viruses, but these are subscriptions that sit on a firewall that if there was a known vulnerability discovered yesterday that for computers, that that would be updated on the perimeter of your network to protect you. Now, you can't just uh, put a firewall out there and not have endpoint protection, which is the antivirus protection on your devices, because it's possible somebody's going to come into the office with a thumb drive or a, lap or a uh, USB drive and plug it in and bypass the firewall, but you want to have this layered security. So we see lack of security subscriptions, lack of encryption all across the board, but specifically on servers. And if you go out to the HIPAA wall of shame, which is the website that the Office for Civil Rights publicizes the breaches of over 500 records on, if you look up network servers, you'll be surprised at how many servers are on that list. We all think of laptops as being lost or stolen, and they are, and they're the uh, more often than, say, servers but it's surprising to see how many servers are on that list. So don't think that just because you have data on a server 
uh, we've seen servers that are sitting in a practice administrator's office next to her desk. We've seen servers in racks in the middle of a medical office. We've also seen servers in highly secure data centers. But keep in mind that that's where the mother load is of all your patient data is on your servers and we often find servers are not encrypted. Uh, backup media, and the term media could mean anything from a tape, there's still people using tapes, to local hard drives uh, or portable hard drives that people take off site, or even up to the cloud where backups may go from the office up into a service that's available through the internet. And when we look at backup media, I just talked about the situation where there was a $750,000 fine when an unencrypted hard drive was stolen in that bag from the cancer uh, oncology clinic. But, but we see backup media, and again, if you look at that HIPAA wall of shame, you'll find a lot of tapes and portable hard drives listed there. And then the, the last comment, the bullet, is again, practice administrators, executives, people will believe what they're being told without getting an audit. And the audit in healthcare terms is a second opinion. If someone told you you had you know, a very bad medical condition, I think a lot of people in today's world would not just accept it from a single doctor, but they would want to get a second opinion. And there again, that would require bringing in an outside security consultant. Mike, you know, uh, usually we save the questions for the end, but somebody mentioned this, and I think it's, while we're on the subject, it's worth uh, talking about. They said that in their experience of going, I, I take it that they're in IT, when they look, when they visit practices and look at their equipment, a lot of the time they find that people have installed routers that are just consumer home-based routers that they picked up from Best Buy or something like that. Why is that a problem? Well, it's a great question, Brian, and it's not just a situation with routers from Best Buy. It also uh, can apply to computers themselves, desktop computers or laptop computers, and uh, mobile devices that people want to carry, whether they're smartphones or tablets, where they want to put data. So going back to the original question about the routers from Best Buy, uh, in many cases, you don't even buy a router because when you are getting an internet service from a cable company or a phone company, they'll provide you with a router as part of the service. That's the device that is plugged in sometimes with red lights or green lights that flash, and that's the device that connects you to the internet. Now, a firewall is also a device that connects you to the internet that has flashing lights on it. The difference is that the firewall is a true barrier that keeps people from the internet from hacking into your network. Remember that when you're connected to the internet, the internet is connected to you. So a consumer grade device, whether you get it free from the cable company or the phone company, or you go to Best Buy or any other electronics provider uh, that's selling consumer grade equipment, it's not appropriate and it's not compliant with HIPAA. It's also not the level of security that you need. On the computers themselves, if you buy a home computer, and that means a computer, say a laptop or a desktop, that has a home operating system on it, which could be Windows 7, 8, or now 10, it may not have, if it's a home operating system, it will not have the security built in that's required to protect patient data. So routers and those types of devices, but also consumer-grade equipment. And we're going to be talking about laptops and computers and mobile devices as we move on. All right. Well, let's go ahead and move on then. And in fact, that's our next slide. So what about computers and laptops? Well, th there's a lot of things that related to it. But again, let's look at what HIPAA is designed to do. The HIPAA security rule is, desi is designed to protect the security of patient data. So let's just start with the data. Where is your data? When we go into healthcare organizations and we do audits, we find data in a lot of places that people aren't expecting it to be, and that has both business and security and compliance consequences. If data is stored on a local device, so let's assume you have a computer network, you have a computer at your desk or a laptop 
doesn't matter whether it's connected with a wire or if it's a wireless connection, that computer is quote unquote on the network. When organizations set up their backup routines for data, and data has a value, so it's important uh, to protect the data so you don't lose it, but also if you had to re-enter it by hand, that can cost thousands of dollars if it's lost and it's not backed up. So we find a lot of situations where the organizations allow users to store data locally instead of forcing it to go out onto the servers on the network, but then when we check their backup setup, we find that only the servers are being backed up and no local machines. Now, this is a compliance question because HIPAA has a requirement for data to be backed up and sent off-site, but it's also a business issue that if that person's device is damaged, if, say, the hard drive fails, or if it's stolen, you have a compliance issue and you may have an, a business issue because it's not backed up. One of the uh, great examples of having local data on computers is in your neck of the woods, Brian, where a Chicago area hospital advocate healthcare in one of its doctor's clinics out in uh, the suburbs had a burglary and a couple of desktop computers were stolen and they breached four million records. And the first thing that the executive said during the interview with the Chicago Tribune was, based on our policies, that data should never have been on those devices. So this is another place where we find a lot of disconnect between what policies people think are in place and what's really happening. So the local data isn't backed up, it's not encrypted, and it's vulnerable to loss or theft. Encryption does two things. One is it protects the data from being accessed by someone who's not authorized to access it, but it's also a get out of jail free card in the sense that the HIPAA data breach rule says that if a device is encrypted and it's lost, it's not reportable. So when it comes to a device being stolen or lost, if there's data on it and that device is encrypted, there's no HIPAA issue, there's no penalty. Uh, obviously, you have the issue of replacing the device and, and any costs that are incurred there, but you aren't going to get the $1.7 million fine that the state of Alaska Health Department got for losing a, an unencrypted hard drive or the $750,000 fine that the cancer clinic just got for losing an unencrypted laptop and unencrypted backup media. And there are many others that are listed out <coughs> on the OCR website. The other thing about computers and laptops that we see is that they're not centrally managed. And even in a small office, five or 10 employees, but certainly as you get into these larger organizations, we find devices where the way that they're set up on the network is that they're not, act, they're not joined to the domain. They're not set up with group policies. Patches and updates are not handled centrally. Antivirus or anti-malware software is not managed by a central console someplace. And a central console means that either an IT department or a, a managed service provider, and that's an IT company that offers services, in many cases, to smaller practices and organizations that can't afford an IT department. They can sit in one place and look at completely across the network and see every device and what its status is and make sure it's getting its patches and updates and that everything is, is compliant and secure without having to run around and touch every machine. It can't be done. Microsoft sends out patches every couple of weeks. There are other software pro, uh, companies that send out patches and updates. Uh, you have the firmware, the devices like the routers and the uh, firewalls that need to be updated. It's virtually impossible to manage manually and there are now tools that the managed service providers have and an IT department and a larger organization should have to centrally manage these things. The last thing on the list is that when we talk about security, we've also, you know, I've already said that uh, it can be inconvenient, but for whatever reason, people kind of think that their desktop computers are their own and they can go and install whatever they want to install on them and sometimes they're not consciously installing something, but they've gotten a 
phishing email, P-H-I-S-H-I-N-G, email that has tricked them into clicking on something. And when they do that, it's installing software in the background that they aren't even aware of. So if the computers are locked down so that the users don't have the rights, the technical rights, to install software, number one, that makes it much easier to manage the entire environment and keep it secure. The other thing is, is that it won't uh, bring the network down by accident in the sense that someone got a phishing email and clicked and it installed some sort of uh, software that's going out and stealing data. Yeah, and just to emphasize what you were saying about Advocate, you know, unfortunately, I, if someone breaks into your facility and they're just interested in stealing hardware, that is a crime that you have suffered, obviously, but the HIPAA consequences are still on you because you have this obligation to protect that data. So even if someone breaks into your facility and it happens all the time and they steal hardware that has unencrypted uh, PHI on it, you can get in trouble for that. It's unfortunate, but it's a fact of life. Well, and Brian, it's not just trouble. There's a true cost to the organization. So every year there's a cost of a data breach study. And in 2015, this year, they were examining the breaches that occurred in 2014. And across all industries, the average cost of a data breach is $217 per record. However, in healthcare, it's three hundred and ninety eight dollars per record now this is an accurate number based on research but where does three hundred and ninety eight dollars come from it's not just the cost to notify patients and to you know publicize things on a website and pay for credit monitoring which are the direct costs that you suffer after a breach but the three hundred and ninety eight dollars also took into account the loss of business that the organizations suffered when they had a breach and then they lost the trust of their customers or their patients. Absolutely. So let's move on to the next slide. What is it, and we've already had some questions about this, so I'm glad we're addressing this. What about cloud computing do people need to keep in mind? Well, first of all, cloud computing is a pretty broad uh, concept. And essentially, it's any service that's provided through the internet. That means that it's something that is not being uh, managed or perhaps stored on your local network. So some of the things that we've seen, and we have clients who are uh, users of cloud computing, but we also have clients that are vendors of cloud computing and, and cloud services. So we see it from both sides. The first thing is that there can be uncontrolled access to the cloud. I mean, everyone has access to the cloud sitting at their computer and having a, uh, a, a internet program to run a browser to be able to go out and get to a cloud service. So it's not something that's easy to secure and keep people from going to. But some of the things that we've seen with cloud services, some of them advertise that they're HIPAA compliant. And I see logos and I see you know big red letters on websites that say we're HIPAA compliant. We've talked to some of those companies. Uh, we, one of the things we've said to them is maybe it would help to spell HIPAA correctly and not have it spelled with two P's yeah. when you say you're HIPAA compliant. But the other thing is that even if they're spelling it correctly, can you prove it? And some of them will sign business associate agreements, some won't. That's a, one of the first signs. If they do sign it, they think in many cases that's the end of their compliance responsibility when in truth it's only the beginning because they have to train their employees, they have to meet all the HIPAA requirements of a business associate. And a lot of the cloud services, the products that you see advertised through the cloud and you know, click here and set up this file sharing or set up this online backup, those are services where the companies have their servers and their backend, the uh, behind the scenes technology for their service in data centers that they don't own. So data centers have to sign HIPAA business associate agreements and also comply. And today, even uh, long after the omnibus rule that said that went into effect, some of the data centers are refusing to do it and claiming they don't have to comply with HIPAA when they do. So you really have to connect the dots. Keep in mind that through any cloud service, 
your data is ending up in a server someplace and you need to know that that server is secure and that the organizations uh, that house it are compliant. The contracts that you sign with a cloud service always favor the cloud service. I mean, that's what they're paying their lawyers for, is to write a contract that favors them. And what we've seen in some of these contracts, and when we've asked questions, is a general lack of transparency. Who has the custody of your data? Custody means who's got the physical data in their devices, and where are those? And when we start asking questions, we'll hear from cloud vendors, well, that's competitive information we don't share with people and all that. If I'm putting all of my patient records out on a cloud service, I want to know where I can drive to and see the server that that data is sitting on and know that it's in a secure and compliant location. I don't want to find out the cloud service is really in someone's garage and that it's the same computer that shared, you know, that the kids play games on. So one of the issues that we've run into going back to contracts is that there are attorneys that specialize in this and they will negotiate with a cloud service, for example, to make sure that people can get to their data. They make sure that the data is backed up and that there are some test restores done periodically to prove that it can be recovered. And then what happens if you decide you don't want to continue with that service? Can you get your data back? And we've heard horror stories about cloud vendors that have told organizations that if that they have to pay thousands and thousands of dollars if they want their data back. And that's the first time that the healthcare provider or the client went and looked at the details of the contract they signed to find out that yes, that's in the contract. The other thing is that there's been there have been some situations that have been publicized about medical practices that had problems with their cloud-based electronic health record vendor and they weren't getting the problems resolved so they stopped paying them and the cloud vendor turned off their access to their own medical records so they couldn't see patients. So there's a lot to the cloud and the bottom line is that security is out of sight and out of mind and there's still ways to make sure that the cloud vendors are secure and compliant. So you've talked a little bit about phones um, and how they are kind of being let onto networks willy-nilly these days. What do people need to understand about mobile devices? Well, first of all, we all have them and not everyone understands them. And the security that, that is built in or can be uh, implemented onto a phone. So we all know that phones you know, are easy to lose or have stolen. And if they're not locked, and locked means that on uh, an iPhone or an Android phone, you simply have to put a code in to unlock the phone so you can get to the uh, applications that are on it, that if you don't have that turned on, anyone that grabs your phone can have access to your personal data. And the part that we worry about certainly is the business data that may be stored on the phone. Uh, love everybody, including me, loves the idea that you can have your mail and data synchronized from the office to the phone. And then if you have, say, an iPhone and you're synchronizing from the office to your phone and you've also enabled the iCloud backup, which is a service that Apple offers, and there are other services for Android that will back up your phone. So if it's stolen, you can just reload the backup onto your new phone. That now your corporate data, in some cases your protected health information, may be in an email that is in your office and you think it's secured, but it's also on Dr. So-and-so's phone, and it's also up in Dr. So-and-so's cloud backup for his phone. So if any of those got breached, your patient data is breached and you've got a big problem on your hand. Uh, phones can be remotely wiped if they're lost or stolen. So if you are in an IT environment that has a Microsoft Exchange mail server, that can be set up to synchronize to the phone. Also, it will only synchronize to phones if you set it properly that have the security built in, the uh, encryption code to be able to access the phone and that if the phone is lost, it can be remotely wiped the next time it connects to the internet. 
Uh, other things we see with, with phones is texting. And texting is non-compliant with HIPAA. And when I'm talking about texting, I'm talking about specifically uh, electronic protected health information, patient's identity, plus anything about diagnostic or treatment. And we see it happening every day. People think that when they delete the, test, the text messages from their phones that they're gone. But keep in mind that they're saved up in the system for the carrier and also the person that sent you the text or you received the text from has it on their side also, both on their phone and up in the cloud, where the vendors, uh, AT&T and Verizon and all the wireless companies, store the text messages. So these are common problems we see with uh, mobile devices. What about remote users then? A lot of people are doing more and more work remotely. Um, what's the best way to go about doing that? Well, the, the first thing is that it's a fact of life. So as you said, more and more people are doing it, and you need to anticipate the need and protect against the things that can go bad. We talk to organizations all the time that say, oh, we use VPN connections to link offices to, to the home. Well, a VPN, it, it stands for Virtual Private Network. It's Think of it as a tunnel through the Internet, where it's a tunnel from one point to another point and any of the data that goes back and forth in that tunnel is secured against people, other people on the internet gaining access to it. So logically it would seem that that's a good thing. The problem with VPNs is that they create this tunnel which connects your secure office environment to your high risk home. High risk in the sense that if it's a family computer and the kids are playing games or doing Google searches on hot topics, they're likely to be bringing malware into that home computer. And if that home computer is connected with a VPN and it's mapped the drive from the office to the home computer, it's possible that data at the office will be infected or perhaps even a drive at the office will be locked up with crypto locker and held for ransom, not because of something that happened at the office, but because of something that happened at someone's home connected through a VPN. We also see people, remote users, not using network connections and sometimes it's because they have a cabin out in the woods, they don't have a good connection, so they're using flash drives for moving data and obviously that does two things. That makes it easy to lose the flash drive and it leaves the data stored on the home computer and if it's on the home computer, who's looking at it? How do you get it back if you terminate the employee? Those are some questions that people really can't answer well when they realize that their data is on a system that they don't own. So the best way to connect remote users is secure remote access to a desktop PC where you're at home but you're actually controlling a computer in your office so data never transfers to the home. Or there's a thing called terminal servers. Uh, sometimes people are familiar with the term Citrix, which are remote control servers where you access them from a remote location. but no data moves back and forth. So you talked about the fact that when people get audited now, their business associates are going to get audited too. How do business associates affect HIPAA compliance? Well, they can affect HIPAA compliance in a huge way. The first thing is that if you look at the wall of shame, you'll see that business associates have caused about a third of the breaches. But that's not what you should worry about, if you look at the numbers of, of the uh, records that were breached, you'll find that HIPAA business associates have caused more than half of the breached records. So it's a real problem out there. I've said before, many of them are not aware of their responsibility. They'll say they signed an agreement and they don't realize that they have to implement training, policies, procedures, and all the things in their organization to comply with HIPAA. Uh, my experience is that it doesn't take long when you talk to most business associates to realize that they would fail an audit. And if you're a medical practice, you are responsible for your business associate's compliance and to make sure that they're compliant because you're trusting them with your patient data. And if you are a business associate, you are responsible responsible for your subcontractors. Any companies like cloud vendors or online backup companies 
or hosting services that you bring into the relationship with your healthcare clients. So you can't just sign an agreement and say we're done. When you sign an agreement, if you're a healthcare provider, you're just beginning in the sense that you need to make sure your business associates stay compliant. And if you're a business associate, you have to realize you can't just sign an agreement. There's a lot of work to do to be compliant with HIPAA. All right, so this is really the million dollar question and there's no way to you know, get to everything in uh, the short time we have left, but what can a practice do to protect itself against data breaches and get ready for these audits that are coming? Well, uh, these are things that we've talked about. Treat your data like gold. Don't think of it as data or words or some characters that are typed into a computer. There are people that will pay a lot of money to steal it. So you have to realize that it has value. It's part of the value of your medical practice. If you're a doctor, those medical records are tangible property that's valuable when you sell your practice. But also, you need to protect it. If data was a 10-pound bar of gold, you'd throw your body over it. You wouldn't take it and put it in a laptop and leave it on the back seat of your car. You need to control your users and control your devices. That truly means control in the literal sense. You have to be able to make your users do things that are compliant. You have to have your devices set up that they're secure and compliant. HIPAA and Meaningful Use both say you need to get a security risk analysis. The federal government says that if you want one to pass an audit, you should consider using an experienced outside professional. So that's something that is part of the rule. We also recommend a HIPAA compliance assessment, which is different than a risk analysis, to see if overall the organization's complying with the uh, privacy rule, security rule, data breach rule, and the omnibus final rule. You have to manage your risks. HIPAA says that you have to have a risk analysis, and a lot of times people will ask for a risk analysis and tell us they had a risk analysis, but then when we read it and look at what was found, we find that they haven't managed the risks that are in there. And that was something that came out at that HIPAA conference a couple weeks ago. Devin McGraw, who's the uh, assistant director in charge of privacy, says that these lost, unencrypted laptops and other devices are evidence that most organizations that have suffered those losses have not done a complete or an accurate risk assessment and managed their risks. And the last time is you have to look at HIPAA is an ongoing process. It's not a project, it's not an audit, it's not a risk analysis. It's an ongoing process that has to be consistently maintained and repeated. Every year you need to get your risk analysis either redone or you review it. Every new employee that comes to you has to be trained in HIPAA. You have to do ongoing training for your current staff. You have to make sure your machines are constantly patched and updated and secured. So it's an overall compliance program. It's not a one-time event. Right? Well, we're just about out of time here. Uh, you know, we've got some good questions, but I think we need to take those questions and send them to Mike, and he will give you written answers to those questions. There's questions on everything from, you know, how do you prove that your device was encrypted to cloud questions, and I'm sure Mike will be happy to provide you answers with those. We'll, we'll send those out to everybody um, if we can get those uh, written out so that everybody can enjoy and learn from those. I want to thank you so much for being with us today, Mike. This is a really great session full of very important information. So thank you so much. Great to be with you again, Brian. And by the way, our website is listed on this last slide. Uh, there's a contact us uh, part of the website. If you ever have a HIPAA question, anybody on this call, just feel free to send it. We'll be glad to send you an answer. Absolutely. So, so you see that website there, www.semelconsulting.com. Be sure to stop by that website if you have any questions for Mike or if you might need his professional services. Go ahead and uh, you couldn't find a better HIPAA security expert than Mike Semmel. If you need training in Meaningful Use PQRS or HIPAA compliance, including the HIPAA training that Mike Semmel authored, you can go to www.formedtraining.com to sign up for those classes. Again, if you're looking for the slides or the video recording of this event, we're going to send those out just as soon as we can get them ready. It's usually within about 24 hours, so keep your eyes peeled for that if you'd like to share this information with anyone. And then uh, go to our homepage at formatapproved.com and click on the Learning Lunch button if you'd like to register for any of our upcoming Learning Lunches 
or any of the workshops that are uh, um, thrown by Form and Approved. So I want to thank all of our audience members for joining us today. We got some great questions, and I hope this session was useful to you. Thank you again to you, uh, Mike Semmel, for joining us. And uh, please join us for our next Learning Lunch. All right, everybody, have a great week.